excited today to be continuing the series that we began just last week entitled Thy Kingdom Come. We have, over the past four months, been studying through Jesus teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount, and we are continuing that. We suggested last week that be an implication of the radical nature of the teaching of Jesus is that what he has brought with his life, death, and resurrection and ascending of the Holy Spirit is the inbreaking of what the scriptures call the age to come. That we are, by the Holy Spirit, participants in what the Bible calls new creation and what we read about in the book of Revelation as the new heavens and the new earth. That that reality is breaking into the present and that we are participants in it as citizens of what Jesus called the kingdom of God. And that life as citizens of the kingdom of God is not initiated, sustained, and strengthened by human power or human will or strength, but by divine power, will, and strength. And that if you and I are going to live as citizens of that kingdom, it is a life that is undergirded and strengthened in intimate connection with God through prayer. And so we are looking at together the prayer that Jesus teaches us in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And so our reading each week will be that. As we read from Matthew 6, starting in verse 9, I invite you to stand as we say this together. Now, when we say, as you're standing, as we say the Lord's Prayer, we all learn the Lord's Prayer a little different. Some people, our Father who art in heaven, some people, you know, we're forgiven for debts, other people are forgiven for trespasses, I'm not sure which one. So just for today, and for the remaining of our time, we're going to read as the NIV has it uh, here. Um, if you really want to say trespasses, we will wait for you. <laughs> because love is patient. <laughs> Let's read together. As it says, this is then how you should pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessing on our time together. We thank you for the scriptures. We thank you for this prayer that our Lord and Savior Jesus taught his disciples and through them have taught us. We pray, Lord, that in our time together we would be formed, taught, and strengthened by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, beginning to look at the Lord's Prayer itself, we are going to explore as a question, what are implications of the fact that when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray and to invoke God in a particular way. And that is to call on God, our Father in heaven. And what are the implications of the fact that when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray and to call out to God as Father. I want to say that there are many implications, and we're going to explore three of them, not saying these are the only three, but I hope that today will encourage us uh, and to help give us tools in our own prayer life as we are invited by Jesus daily to call on God as Father. One implication, and I think the one that is most readily sort of pops out to us, at least I think, 
is the implication that because we call on God as our Father, we are His children. That because God is our Father, we are His children. Secondly, that because God is our Father, we are His people. And we'll talk about what we mean by that. And I would suggest that for a first century Jew, that probably would have been more the forward understanding. That because God is our Father, we are constituted together as his people. And then the last one that we'll explore together is that because God is our Father, we are his apprentices. That as children of the Father, we are apprentices to our Father as we explore each one of these one at a time. The first, again, I would suggest most readily sort of pops to us and how we understand what it means to say God is Father. That is, because God is our Father, we are His children. And we can, and at least I can, very readily, because I was just raised to say this, take for granted the amazing truth that God calls us his children. As the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. Can you see in a, just how amazing it is, just how loving God is, that he is our Father, that he has lavished this love on us, that we should be unbelievably called children of God. It is an amazing thing that you and I, because of Jesus, can call on God as Father. If you were here together with us on Christmas Eve, we explored some together the implications of the fact that Jesus came as the Son of the Father. And some of what we talked about on Christmas Eve, and I'm not going to assume everybody was there, Uh, was that oftentimes in our relationship with God, we have a tendency to relate to God in legal terms. That is, we primarily sometimes conceive of God in terms of him being a judge. And God is a judge. And so that's fair. But sometimes the way that we primarily think of him and the way that we relate to him in our relationship and in our prayers and our daily life is to him as a judge. And what I would suggest Jesus invites us into is not to dismiss that God is a judge, of course, but Jesus invites us to step into a reality in prayer in our relationship with God where we relate to him primarily in paternal terms, in filial terms, that he is our parent, he is our father, and we are his children. And that is a very, very, I think, different primary way of relating to God. If God is primarily related to as a judge, which he is, but when we conceive of him primarily in that sense, in our relationship with him, then at times our relationship with him can be conceived as if God is looking down upon us as any judge would be doing, keeping very close eye on everything that you do and think that is wrong and keeping a very articulate, you know, scrupulous list so that when the day comes and you stand before him, he as a righteous judge is all set to go to confront you with everything that you've done. But then we relate to God as Father. I would suggest we relate to God differently. Jesus, or the Apostle Paul describes what it means to relate with God through Jesus in this way in Romans 8. In Romans 8, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says that the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. What the Apostle Paul says when he talks about living in fear again is that we are or once were under what he calls the law of death. The law of death, that is that there is a law that God sets before us and that we are called as creatures of God to 
maintain and live up to the standard that God puts for us in the law. Now, here's the problem. Does anybody do that? Is anybody ever? And so because of that fact that nobody can live up to the standard of the law, then we live in fear because we know that we're lawbreakers and we know that what is a just due punishment for the law uh, that is broken by us, which is condemnation. And so that causes us to live in fear. But, Paul says, because of the Spirit, you are not made slaves anymore, so we are no longer under the law that leads to death, but the law that leads to life. We are under the law of the Spirit, under the law of Christ. So that it doesn't mean that there's no more law, because is the law bad? Absolutely not. The law is not bad. The problem is, are you bad? That's the problem. If you weren't bad, we'd have no problem. There's nothing wrong with the law. There's something wrong with us. And so it says that Jesus was sent by the Father in order to, un, born under the law, he says, in order that he would fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. And so because of Jesus' perfect obedience, now rather than living in fear, he says that the spirit that you received has brought about, as the apostle says, adoption, to sonship. And because of our adoption to sonship by the Spirit, we, by the Spirit, cry, Abba, Father. Now, I would suggest, who is the only one that really has the right to cry out, Abba, Father? Jesus. Jesus is the one who is pre-existent from all time, has always been the Son to the Father. The Father has always been the Father to the Son, and they have always existed before time began in a relationship of love and belonging and care and community. And that because of the Holy Spirit and because of the perfect righteousness of Christ, we are brought into and participate in that divine reality. That because we are united to Christ by the Holy Spirit, we are invited to participate in the relationship of love between Father and Son. It is for that reason. And you probably heard sermons where people say, you know, when Jesus was being baptized, and it says that, at least in the Gospel of Mark, that the, the terms are that the heavens were torn open, and that the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit comes down as a dove, descends upon Jesus, and there is a voice from heaven who cries out, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Would suggest the only reason that you can hear those words pronounced over you, which I suggest that they are, is because you are united to Christ. You are united to him in his perfect obedience and in his life you, partic you participate in this relationship between father and son. And so you now can cry, Abba, Father. Because Jesus does, and you participate in his life. And that should transform the way that we pray. The deeper we understand our identity as dearly loved children, quoting from Ephesians 5.1, the greater our desire to spend time with our Father in prayer. If we conceive of God as a cosmic elf on the shelf who's just watching us or every move is going to report us to his dad because his dad's a judge who's going to make sure we get our due... Does that sound like somebody you want to spend a lot of time with? I think I'd be kind of afraid. But the more we understand that we are dearly loved children, the more we understand that the pronouncement over Jesus at his baptism, because of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, is what is pronounced over us. We no longer live in fear. And we can, as the scriptures say, with confidence come before God at his throne, knowing that who is at God's right hand? Jesus, who lives ever interceding for us at the Father's right hand. The Spirit also groaning in prayer for us at all times. So when we pray, Father, we are invited into the deepest level of intimacy with God. That what God desires for you and with you is a relationship of intimacy. 
Do you have an intimate relationship with God? What I'm not asking is, do you believe God is the Son of God and died for your sins? That's not my question. My question is, do you have an intimate relationship with God? That intimacy of relationship is found in prayer. It is prayer. Just like if, I could, if, if you're married, I could ask you a, a question, or if you have, a, you know, with your children, or if children with friends, whatever, if you think about relationships that are important to you, I could ask you a question, do you have intimacy in that relationship? And the question is, do, if you don't spend any time with them, and I asked you, do you have intimacy of, intimacy of relationship with them, the answer would have to be no. I don't know how, and someone can help explain to me how you can have relation, an intimacy of relationship with no communication. I don't know how it's possible. And Jesus invites you, because of who he is and by the Holy Spirit, to enter into intimacy with the God who made you and loved you so much that he himself would come and die for you. Are you entering into that? Is that a reality? Or if nothing else, is that well something up within you to go, maybe I'm not living into it, but I want to. But I want to. So God is our Father, therefore we are his children. Secondly, God is our Father, therefore we are his people. That is, our relationship with God is not simply individual. Yes, it is individual. It's not less than that, but it is more than that. And that when God saves us, we enjoy more than a simple individualistic relationship with God, but we are made a part of a covenant family together. And that God is our Father, and we are His people constituted together. And we suggest that for a first century Jew, this probably would have been the primary resonance, that because God is Father, we are His people, because the Old Testament is not devoid of the language of God as Father. The language of God as being Father is found in the Old Testament. Now, not near to the extent that Jesus uses it in his ministry. By the time we get from Matthew to the end of John, uh, for the, the way that the different writers portray Jesus through the Gospels, Jesus refers to Father as God as Father about 170 times. That's a lot compared to about 15 times in the Old Testament. So Jesus takes the concept of Father and just really puts it front and center. But in the Old Testament, God reveals himself as a father primarily at the Exodus event. That is, at the Exodus, God reveals himself as a father, and he reveals himself as a father specifically to the nation, the people of Israel. We read in the book of Exodus chapter 4, when God is speaking to Moses, he says, say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship and serve me. So if Israel is God's firstborn son, then God is their father. God is their father. In the Old Testament, you often re uh, see God referred to as a redeemer or the redeemer. The language of redeemer in the Old Testament primarily refers to God's actions in the Exodus. And we see in the book of Isaiah, God again referred to his father. He says, you, Lord, are our father, our redeemer. From of old is your name. Because it's when God delivers his people out of Exodus, that he reveals himself as their father. As we see in the book of Hosea, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. This passage being picked up by the gospel writer Matthew in reference to Jesus, although for Hosea referring to the nation of Israel. So when God reveals himself as a father, he reveals himself as the father of the Israelite nation and the father of God's people, better said, in that as a father he delivers and saves and redeems his people. That is in the act of deliverance, it's in the act of salvation that God reveals himself as a father. Because it's God's people who are in bondage 
who cry out to God, God intervenes in order to redeem and save them, that he constitutes them together as his children. And this is, by the way, also seen in the New Testament. The idea that we are God's children together, not just individually. In the book of Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul expounds on spiritual gifts, and he says that we are all have different gifts, the same spirit, but different manifestations of the same gift, and that these different gifts constitute us together as what? The body of the Son. That each of us together make up the Son in Jesus. So what this means is, is that in your life in prayer, you are not simply invited to relate to God into a level of intimacy. Yes, you are. But you are also invited to pray to God as Father as your refuge, as the one who has delivered you, the one who has saved you. Because what Jesus did in his earthly ministry is to enact a second exodus. It's a new exodus. An exodus where God is delivering his people from bondage, just as he did in the Hebrew scriptures. And what God delivers his people from bondage from is what is at the deepest level always enslaved them, what has always enslaved you and what has always enslaved me. Sin, death, and evil. And just as as a result of the salvific acts of God in the, in the Exodus, God's people are constituted as a child. So in the salvific acts of Christ, because of the Holy Spirit, we are constituted together as one body, being delivered by God who cry out to him as our Father. Oftentimes in the Scriptures, when we face, when, when they are facing, and we can put ourselves in their shoes, when we are facing trials, And we begin to wonder, what is God doing? Where is God? The scriptures will oftentimes recount the faithfulness and the deliverances of God in the past. It is not uncommon to be reading from the Psalms or to be reading in in the Hebrew scriptures and to hear someone tell a story, in the New Testament too, to tell the story of the Exodus because it's in the Exodus they remember the deliverance of God. And each one of us here, if we were to allow time for everyone to spend time at a mic, each one of us could give testimony to how in our lives God has delivered us. And we all together with one voice can cry out together how God has delivered all of us from sin, death, and evil. And I encourage you in prayer as you cry out to God as Father, to remember that he is a refuge, he is your deliverer, he has delivered you, he is delivering you, and he will deliver you again. Because he is our father, and we are his people. And then lastly, because God is our father, we are his apprentices. We might use the word disciple or follower, but I think the word apprentice is helpful to understand what we mean. It is interesting uh, in the scriptures that we refer to Jesus, well, let's say this. I remember in the 90s, at least when I said this last night, no one, maybe it's just in Colorado, but uh, they used to have bumper stickers that said, um, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. Did they have these here? Okay. I mean, my dad had one on his car. I remember thinking, like, is that the best thing to have on your car? He wasn't the best driver. (laughs) Sorry, Dad. Uh, He's gotten better. (laughs) Um, But here's a question. Why is it that we refer to Jesus as a carpenter? Is there any place in Scripture that we have that says, Jesus was outside with a saw making things with wood? The reason why we assume that Jesus was a carpenter is because we have testimony that Joseph was a carpenter. Because they say, is this not the carpenter's son? So we assume that because Joseph was a carpenter, that Jesus was. Because in the first century, if you were a child, it was expected that you would learn the trade of your father. 
If your father was a carpenter, you learned to be a carpenter. If your father was a stonemason, you learned to be a stonemason. If, if your father was a farmer, you learned to be a farmer because that's what you did. You are an apprentice of your father. And Jesus was an apprentice to his heavenly father. We read when Jesus went with his family to the temple when he was young to celebrate a festival. When the family left, uh, they forgot Jesus. It's interesting to think about that. I don't know how long it takes you to realize you're missing one of your kids. Mary and Joseph, it took them a while. And so they realize Jesus is missing and they go back to Jerusalem to find him. And here's what Jesus says, because where do they find Jesus? Where was he? He was in the temple. And they talking with Jesus, say, Jesus. And Jesus says this, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Jesus is an apprentice to his father. He learned from his father. Isn't it interesting to think of Jesus, the eternal Son of God, as learning? But the scriptures say that Jesus grew in wisdom and Jesus grew in stature, both with God and with men. That Jesus, as both God and man, learned. And he learned as an apprentice to his father. He did what he saw his father doing. In fact, Jesus says exactly that. He says, truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. It's interesting to read these verses through the eyes of what it means to be an apprentice, what it means for the son to learn and to follow after his father. And if you were an apprentice, you would regularly go to your father to check in. So as a carpenter, you, 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 your father would teach you and you would learn and you'd do some carpentry and then you'd take it to your father. You'd say, how's this look? And the father would say, yeah, pretty good, but you need to do this wine scene. You go back, okay, and you, you work on it again. Okay, father, how's this look? That's what an apprentice does. And Jesus does that. It's just, even the book of Hebrews says that son though he was, he learned obedience by what he suffered. I'm reminded of Jesus and the episode at the Garden of Gethsemane when he was certainly suffering. He takes his disciples, he's praying. It says that he is praying with such pain and fervency and, and with such anxiety that he sweats drops of blood. And in that prayer, he goes to his father, I would suggest, in a way of checking in. Father, is this really it? Is this really the plan? Is there anything else that we can do here? It's the son taking to the father and saying, Father, is this right? And Jesus, as the perfect apprentice, says, but not my will, but yours be done. And so when we pray, as God is our father, and we as his apprentice, and he is the master, we are praying in such a way that we offer ourselves to him in order that he may mold us and shape us as a potter does to clay. In fact, we see that exact language in the book of Isaiah where we read, you, Lord, are our father, we are clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So praying to God as Father is not simply intimacy. It is intimacy. It's also seeking God as a refuge and a help and for deliverance, yes. And it's also to say, Lord, take me, mold me, and shape me. You know, just two days ago, we had a funeral here.
for someone that I would suggest prayed to God as Father and understood what it meant to say, I am your apprentice. Mold me and shape me however you will. And that was Renee Kidder. Renee overcame lots of things in her life. But she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2015 and went to see the Lord on Tuesday night. And that she learned obedience through what she suffered. And that Jesus took Renee as Renee offered herself completely to Jesus and made something beautiful out of her life. Just to tell one story, a story that was told at her funeral, but worthy of repeating. Renee and Mark would go uh, to see doctors, of course, for treatments having to do with her cancer. These doctors were highly, highly intelligent, highly skilled. I mean, they would travel different places to meet with the best of the best, so to speak. One time they were going to a, a doctor to have some consultations and um, had a conversation with them. Now, I say this about doctors. My dad is a doctor. So, and there may be some doctors here. So this is nothing about anybody, my dad. But doctors sometimes can have a bit of what we might call a God complex. And what I mean is, is that um, doctors can be very sure of themselves. They know a lot. And they really do play with life and death in their hands. I mean, I can see it. So these doctors meet with Renee and Mark. And there's something about Renee. Now, when they talk with them, the doctor says, you know, Renee, there's something different about you. Because you have such joy that you exude as you're going through this excruciating ordeal. Now, if I can completely imagine a doctor saying that in passing. I mean, you can, you can kind of see how you, you see someone that has a good attitude and you want to compliment the person with a good attitude. That makes sense. And um, so I can see a doctor going, you know, you seem to have a lot of joy. That's great. Okay, let's have our consultation and here's the deal. We'll see you later, right? But that's not what these doctors did because Renee was not an ordinary person. And so the doctor said, why is that? What is different about you? And they, well, how to put this? They stopped talking and listened for five to six minutes. In other words, they really cared. There was something so different about her. It wasn't just a, like a compliment on the side, okay, let's get to our consultation. They really wanted to know because there was something supernaturally different about Renee. And Renee gave testimony of the saving grace of her Lord and Savior, Jesus. Because when you offer yourself to your heavenly Father as clay in the hands of the master potter, he will take it and he will mold you into something extraordinary. God is your Father. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are not just our maker. You are not simply our creator. You are those things. But you reveal yourself to us as our Father. And we thank you that because of Christ, and because of the Holy Spirit and the love that you have for us, we are invited to partake in a relationship of intimacy with you. And we thank you that because of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit and your love for us, that we are delivered from bondage and set free from sin and death and evil. And we thank you that because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and your love for us, 
You are our master and we are your apprentices. And you take our lives when we offer them to you and you mold us into something precious. We thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.